Hey, good morning. You found the uh, sermon that we offered today during the liturgies, uh, but I like having these to uh, come back to. So uh, here we go. Join me, won't you, in prayer? O Almighty God, who pourest out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication, deliver us when we draw near to thee from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections we may worship thee in spirit and truth. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. There's really no getting around it. Uh, this sermon is going to get, I think, a little nerdy. Sometimes as a preacher, you can't help yourself, and this week's lesson from Matthew is one of those passages that just grabs my attention and won't let go. Of course, it is one of the gospel's greatest hits, isn't it? The miraculous feeding of the 5,000 as a sign both of Christ's great compassion and of his great power. It's one of the church's favorite images of Jesus's ministry. But I've had this feeling, really since carefully reading through Matthew's colleagues, uh, Mark, through, uh, through, his, through last fall in his account of the gospel, that there's just a little bit more going on in how the story works together. Before I get ahead of myself, let's begin in Isaiah. So think back to uh, Isaiah's uh, lesson this morning. It's in just five short verses. The prophet reminds us of two of the great promises of God. One is that he seeks to bring true relief and abundance to his people, which is impressed upon us with that image of cool water, good wine, rich milk, sweet honey, and the food of life, of course, bread. The second promise shows that abundant life is not just about uh, like a great divine cheese board and charcuterie, something as awesome as that is, but rather part of a greater design and program that includes the coming of a great king, and therefore a great kingdom that reflects God's goodness and generosity to all the nations. Spoiler alert. The proclamation of the gospel writers is that very king was present among us in Christ Jesus. And he was inaugurated, and he has inaugurated that rule by his ministry, by his cross, passion, and resurrection, and ascension. Today's lesson, that rule was happening right before his disciples' eyes, and in his compassion was evident as he fed all those hungry folks. The story, of course, itself is amazing, but what comes before it is actually part of uh, an incredible work of biblical reporting and theology, and that's what's kind of got my attention today. Because going back a few chapters, say like chapter 10 or so, chapter 11, we see Jesus' people making contact with John the Baptist people and basically telling them to tell John that Jesus is the real deal. Jesus was the real deal. The Messiah come to fulfill that to which John had been pointing in his own ministry. And in the text that follows, and really between our next meeting where we, where we meet with John again, uh, foreshadowing something cool there, Jesus has worked out his ministry through healings and exorcisms, works of mercy among the people of the Judean countryside. He consistently illustrated his authority throughout this part of Matthew's account of the gospel, like the, 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 the text between chapter 11 and 14. And Jesus even used this opportunity to train his disciples for ministry and then taught the folks around him in parables. Now, of course, that might ring a bell, as we've actually been reading a few of those over the past few weeks. Each parable was a parable of the kingdom, meant to highlight the nature of Christ's anointed status, as well as use heightened language to draw out the human imagination for, God, for what God's righteous kingdom is really like. And those with ears to hear, those who had spent time going around with him, who had spent the most attention uh, to him, who, excuse me, had paid the most attention to him, would be getting the picture over and over that Jesus is the Messiah, and that wonderful kingdom, prefigured by Isaiah and other writers of ancient Israel, was happening right before them in Christ. And then as we get to a little bit before where we began our, our lesson today, something kind of weird happens, right? In chapter 14, as it begins, we get a brief interlude with, that includes our old friend, John the Baptist, and also includes an old foil of both Jesus and John, Herod. So we read about a less popular, not as remembered portion of the gospel narrative, which is Herod's promise to a dancer uh, to behead John the Baptist in fulfillment of a rather shaky and frankly kind of gross oath he made before her and therefore his court. I'll save you some of the details. You can read them on yourself. But Herod is in his way being kind of like a faithful king. I mean, he's keeping his oaths and delivering on his violent 
promises, but he's delivering on his violent promises. Or excuse me, he's delivering on his promises, isn't he? It's all just super wrong, right? Like it just doesn't make sense. And yet Herod the king does what kings do, right? And I think the reader should be shocked to read about these strange things going on in the court of this human, ostensibly Israelite, this kingdom of this world. And remember, this strange interlude comes on the backs of the comes off the back of accounts of Jesus' divine authority, teachings about who he is, and about how his kingdom should work. And so it sets up a pretty direct contrast, I think. Herod's absurd, outrageous murder of John the Baptist is a major contrast, like I said, to the expectation of what Jesus himself was inaugurating. The rulers of this world, the Herods, they don't hold a candle to what God has in store, to what God has wanted for humanity all along in his goodness. Contrast Herod's bloodthirsty display of courtly politics with how Jesus leads. He sees a crowd and has compassion on them. He heals their sick. He feeds them. He does so much without much commentary. There's much to learn from Jesus' simple and yet miraculous method here, isn't there? Much to be learned, especially if we compare with what it means for Jesus to be the leader and what it means for Herod to be one. Jesus shows us the abundance of God's goodness, mercy, and compassion, the heavenly order of God's original intention for his creation. Herod shows us the stuff that we see all the time, stuff that we should be sick of, frankly. I think that's actually built into the text, and that's why it captures my imagination. If we'd have read these few chapters all the way through, I think a choice becomes evident, or at least clear to us. We end up with a choice to make anyway, though. Matthew and Mark and their friends, the evangelists, deeply desire for his audience to come to know that Jesus is the Messiah, and his justice and abundance is for us and for literally anyone who would follow him. The choice is between that, God's justice and abundance, and the murderous animus of the world as we've made in our image. Now, it's actually not an easy choice to make or else more people would make it, right? Uh, To align themselves with Christ and his goodness. But the world as ruled by Herod is familiar in its brokenness, isn't it? We talked about this when we talked about Romans. For some reason, we keep running to that, don't we? Like a dog to its vomit, like the Proverbs say. The produce of that world seem like milk and honey. But once we've really tasted it, we actually know that it's bitter and spoiled. Beloved, the kingdom of Christ's rule is so much better. So may we take on his yoke and his burden so that we can enjoy his abundant life such that our delight in God's presence with us serves as a witness to the nations and satisfying bread to hungry crowds. But for us, today, this week, let everyone who thirsts, let us come to the living water of Christ's promise and enjoy the milk, wine, and honey of his loving kindness, his gracious and eternal rule in our hearts in this kingdom on earth. To him be all glory from age to age. Amen. Thanks. Take care, guys. Stay dry.